Welcome to part two of our paid sick leave webinar series titled Spotlighting Colorado, Maine, and New York Paid Sick and Personal Leave Development. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. For those of you who are logged in to the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. Questions will be monitored by our presenters throughout the program, and if time allows, the speakers will address questions at the end of the presentation. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write down this code as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials, along with the CLE attendance form, will be distributed to attendees in the days following the program. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Joshua Seidman. Josh, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Morgan. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, really excited that you're all here and joining us today for the next installment of our CIFAR's Pay Sick Leave webinar series, again, spotlighting Colorado, Maine, and New York sick and personal leave development. Um, as you'll see on the next couple of slides, um, so here's our quick legal disclaimer. Uh, and then on the next slide, you'll see I'm joined today uh, by my friends and colleagues, Marlon Duro and Megan Toth. Uh, Marlon and I both work out of our firm's New York office, and Megan is based out of our firm's Chicago office. We're all members of CIFAR's paid leave team, and each of us has spent a great deal of time the last several months working with employers and, and guiding and partnering with our clients as they work through some of the latest and most recent developments in the country's paid sick and personal leave space, and those are the laws in Colorado, Maine, and New York. Um, we're, again, delighted that you've joined us uh, for part two of this series, um, and we're going to be taking a, a closer look at these three mandates and some of their specific requirements and nuances. Um, the agenda, which is in front of you here, you can see we, it is, is jam-packed. Uh, we'll be starting with a discussion and high-level overview of the nation's current paid sick leave landscape. That's going to include a few minutes on the status of COVID-19 supplemental emergency paid sick leave laws. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions from clients about that topic as well, especially laws that might have sunset at the end of last year and what their status is heading into the 2021 calendar year. So we'll spend just a couple of minutes there. Um, we'll also, not to just play too much of a uh, play too much of a spoiler for you, we're also going to have a couple of polling questions um, for you uh, that pop up. No right or wrong answer. It's very easy, but just a little bit of interactive um, questions for you on the tail end of that first topic. We'll then turn our attention to the main events, which are Colorado, uh, Maine, and New York, and then we'll round out with a discussion on federal paid sick leave and the status of laws in that space. So to get us started, paid sick leave nationwide overview. As you'll see on the next slide, there is a, a really messy paid sick leave landscape. I mean, that's really the, the best way to kind of describe what's going on in the country, and it's been that way for quite some time. Uh, 2020, however, really made things quite a bit uh, more complicated, more complex, made the patchwork even more, uh, more, more burdensome for multi-state and nationwide employers to navigate. Um, to work our way left to right from this slide, you'll see the total number of mandates as of last month, about this time last month, was 69 total paid sick and PTO mandates around the country. That is the, the most there's ever been in one point in time um, in terms of this particular space and the, the spread of those laws. The amount of sick leave laws has actually ebbed and flowed quite a bit over the last five or six years. You know, as a state passes a statewide law, some localities might sunset their laws or the localities might actually be preempted by that state law. Other laws get tied up in litigation and get, get taken off the, the list of, of existing laws. Um, but 69 total mandates is, is sort of the peak that we've reached now, you might notice that if you look at the, the three right columns on this slide, you add those up, they don't quite equal the total mandates in the leftmost column. And the reason for that, as we explain in that left column, is that the, is multiple jurisdictions have enacted multiple paid sick or, or PTO mandates. Most current example and, and you know, the most widespread example of this is where a state or locality has both a general paid sick leave law 
and a new COVID-19 temporary or supplemental paid sick leave law. This time last month, California fell into that bucket. Washington, D.C. is still in that bucket. So are New York and Colorado. And again, by that, I mean having both a COVID and a non-COVID general sick leave mandate. Um, there are also some other examples of states or localities having uh, multiple mandates, some of which are general and industry specific. The city of Los Angeles actually has three paid sick leave mandates, one that applies for general sick leave for private employers, one that applies only to certain hotel employers, and one that is a COVID specific mandate. Um, so that's how we get to that total uh, number. Uh, the number is, is changing constantly. Uh, it, it is actually a little bit less probably today than it was at this time last month because of some of these COVID mandates like the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act that you see in that, that second column there having sunset at the end of last year. Uh, again, a big state of flux for that total headcount. Uh, federally, we also have Executive Order 13706, which we'll speak about in a little bit more detail at the tail end of our discussion today. That's paid sick leave for certain federal contractors. Uh, at the state level, well, states plus DC that is, you see 16 total locations um, where the majority of them are paid sick leave mandates, including New York and Colorado that we'll be focusing on, but then also uh, a couple of PTO mandates, and Maine falls into that camp, and, and Marlon will be talking about that um, in a few minutes for you. At the municipal level, 32 different municipalities uh, have paid sick leave for PTO mandates. Some major cities across the country, San Francisco, Seattle, New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, just to name a few, uh, also, a few counties um, that have these types of mandates, Montgomery County in Maryland, Cook County in Illinois, for example, Westchester County in New York, Marlon will also be speaking about for a few minutes later on to give you the status of those two uh, mandates in Westchester County, both a sick time and a safe time mandate out there. Um, finally, for municipalities, uh, we have Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas highlighted in red. Just to, to note, those ordinances are, are not in effect. They're, they're all tied up in three separate litigations. Um, they are all temporarily enjoined at this moment, and the prospects of them going, in, going into effect look, look very slim at this point. But for honorable mention, we, we've thrown them on this list. Um, so as you'll see on the next slide, uh, we have a, a, a really useful resource, um, free you know, for everyone. There's a, a hyperlink at the bottom of the slide. This is SciFarth's uh, SciFarth's latest paid sick leave interactive map. We we rolled it out um, just a couple of days ago, earlier this week. Uh, a lot of time and effort went into it. Um, we did an earlier version of this uh, this concept in late 2018, where you saw the evolution of sick leave over multiple time periods. Pre 2014, where there were only five laws around the country, um, then to 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, and then we've added now the 2019 and 2020 maps uh, to the same resource. 2019, the big pop-ups involve the PTO laws. 2020 involves the, the big you know, changes involving the COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave laws. Um, it shows the proliferation of these laws, both geographically and in terms of their actual content and, and substance, the type of laws that expanded. So the color code is all here for you. Um, really great resource, a lot of really helpful footnotes that we've added to go along with the different maps to explain what you're seeing and all the different colors and moving pieces. Uh, one thing to note too that's also really nice about this map is it shows anti-local leave laws. And what we mean by that is states that have passed a law that says localities within the state cannot pass a paid sick leave local ordinance. If there's going to be a sick leave mandate in the state, it has to come from the state level. So that's what that turquoise, greenish blue color in the middle of the country kind of looks like. Um, so another great resource, we wanted to make sure you're aware of it. Again, hot off the presses from earlier this week. Uh, next slide, please. So one other topic uh, for me substantively before we get to our polling questions and then turn it over to, to Meg and Marlon um, is a quick discussion on COVID-19 uh, sick leave development and PTO development. These developments can be broken into three main groups, and we've color-coded them for you um, to make it more helpful when you see the, the list in a second. So group one, entirely new laws, executive orders, um, what have you, right, that supplemental COVID mandate I've mentioned a few times. Group two, amendments to existing laws or regulations where the, the locality or state adds some new reasons for use or some new conditions um, related to COVID-19. 
And then group number three uh, is non-binding guidance. So no new law, no amendments to existing laws, just some general FAQ or website explaining how sick leave in that location works in light of COVID. And as you'll see on the next slide, last, last year we saw 34 locations, at least 34 locations, have some type of COVID-19 sick or PTO development. Um, if you remember the colors from the, from the prior slide, right, the, the purplish, bluish color shows locations that have had non-binding guidance. That is quite, quite a few, more than a dozen um, locations that have had some type of temporary COVID mandate that's been added, right, as of this time last month, California fell into both of those buckets. It had non-binding guidance and a statewide mandate. Um, today, Los Angeles City uh, and, and San Francisco both fall into that bucket as well. <clears throat> Places like New Jersey and Seattle, towards the bottom of this slide, you'll see in that, in that greenish turquoise color, they both last year amended their sick leave mandates in light of COVID to add some additional reasons for use that are broader than COVID but deal with public health emergencies um, and that are likely to persist beyond the, the current pandemic. Um, the topic that a lot of folks, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, are asking about is, well, what about the laws that were set to sunset at the end of, of last year? You know, what is their current status? Um, there's, again, a lot of moving pieces here. A lot of these mandates get enacted and go into effect immediately without any lag time or waiting period. Um, what we do know, the FFCRA federally, that has sunset, um, although as we'll discuss Later on, there are still some tax credits available for employers who are voluntarily providing those benefits for at least the next couple of months. Uh, the California statewide COVID-19 supplemental sick leave law expired at the end of last month uh, and has not yet seen any new legislation introduced to extend that mandate, although employers and, and our, our paid sick leave team, our California counseling team, we're all sort of on the edge of our seats waiting for, for some news to drop on a potential extension, so stay tuned there. Other places that had their laws uh, sunset at the end of last month or that were scheduled to sunset that have already seen extensions include places like the cities and county of Sacramento. Both of those look like they've been extended into some portion of 2021. Just last week, San Jose extended its ordinance um, that was set to expire last month through the end of June of this year. Um, San Mateo County in California did the same thing. Um, a number of other locations, though, uh, Philadelphia, for example, looks like its mandate has sunset. Um, we're no news on extensions there that we're aware of. Other places in California, Oakland, <clears throat> L.A. County, for example, both look like, while those did expire, they are now currently being considered for potential extensions later this month. So, again, a lot to pay attention to. Um, please stay tuned for more information on those. Um, in, in the coming weeks and months, uh, and, and we'll do our best to keep everybody up to date. Next slide, please. So this takes us to our first polling question. Um, as you should see on the, the right side of your WebEx, um, you should see a couple of choices pop up there. Um, to help you digest what you've seen on the last few slides, we, we like to ask this question for our attendees. In how many states does your company or organization operate? Fewer than five? 6 to 15, 16 to 25, or more than 25 states. Um, the, the answer can really help you try to figure out what your sick leave obligations look like and how complicated compliance can get. As we've seen, though, even if you have operations in just one or two or three states, you can deal with multiple compliance requirements, and it's a patchwork in and of itself. Um, so you can see from the results here, the overwhelming majority of folks who responded, and thank you for those who did, um, have operations in more than 25 states. So, so thanks for, for that one. Um, good to help. And again, those resources we went over, that interactive map being one of them, will be really useful for you as you try to make sense of what your, your patchwork compliance looks like. So on this next slide, we have another uh, polling question, and this is really to get us going uh, so we can help tailor some of the, the next 30 minutes or so of our content for you all. Um, and that is, in which of the three locations we're spotlighting today, Colorado, Maine, and New York, does your company or organization have employees? Colorado only, New York only, Maine only, at least two of those three, or all three of them? Um, and one thing that will be helpful for, for you all as we're working our way from Colorado to Maine to New York is to get a sense of 
what the differences and similarities are between those laws, how they stack up on things like rates of accrual, treatment of new hires, and so on. Um, so it's great for us to see that the overwhelming majority of folks who responded have operations in all three. That is good news and, and what we're hoping um, with number two on this list being folks that have operations in at least two of the three locations. So thank you for everyone for participating. Again, no right or wrong answers. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over uh, to my co-presenter, Meg Toth, to talk you all through of uh, the developments in Colorado. Thank you, Josh. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Meg Toth, and as Josh mentioned, I'm an associate in our labor and employment group based out of Chicago, or Cypher Chicago office. And I'm going to be discussing the ins and the outs of the new and partially old Colorado paid leave entitlements mm -hmm. under the um, Healthy Families and Workplaces Act which you may hear me refer to as the HFWA. If you have employees in Colorado, I am sure you have spent the better part of the last year trying to keep up with the changing laws in this space as it relates to paid leave for COVID. So I'm hopefully gonna clear up some of that um, and also talk about the new general paid sick leave law. Um, and of course, uh, go through how all of these aspects of the HFWA work together. So on the next slide, um, you will see uh, a brief overview here of the HFWA, which was actually enacted in July 14th of 2020, and it consists of three different leave entitlements. There's a COVID-19 paid sick leave specific entitlement, which actually expired at the end of 2020. And what I mean by COVID-19 specific is it actually mentions COVID-19 by name. Um, and I will sort of go into this in more detail, um, at least briefly, just to clear up some sort of confusion about the various aspects of um, COVID-19 leaves that have been in place uh, in a minute. And then the, uh, the second entitlement is a general paid sick leave law, which is very similar to what you've seen, you know, pre-COVID uh, around the country, which was effective um, January 1st of 2021. Uh, and then Finally, the last aspect of it is the public health emergency leave. Um, and this is different from the COVID-19 specific paid leave um, and is just generally applicable to public health emergencies, but of course applies to COVID-19. And this went into effect uh, January 1st of 2021. So on the next slide, taking a closer look at the COVID-19 specific aspect of the HFWA and how it has evolved over the course of the last 10 months, um, even though this has expired, as you'll see um, on December 31st, 2020, uh, I think it'd be helpful to just sort of briefly talk through how um, the COVID-19 specific leave laws have evolved in Colorado because it is a source of confusion for a lot of our clients. Um, so starting in March uh, of 2020, Colorado was actually one of the first states to enact some sort of temporary emergency uh, paid leave, which was the temporary health emergency leave with pay, or as we like to call it, the HELP rule. Um, this provided for initially, you know, a very minimal amount of time off for four days of leave and it was amended, you know, over the over the course of time to eventually provide two weeks of leave. But this was quickly terminated on July 14th uh, of 2020 when the HFWA was enacted. Um, and when the HFWA came into place, as I mentioned before, it had a COVID-19 specific leave that applied and mentioned by name to leaves related to COVID-19. This went into effect immediately upon enactment of the law, but as always contemplated by the law, it expired on December 31st, 2020. And those of you who are familiar with this uh, law, this um, just to give you some perspective, even though it's been expired, this is the law that mirrored the FFCRA uh, which, you know, as many of you probably know, is the, the federal leave entitlement that only applied to employers with less than 500 employees. But this in Colorado generally extended to every employer in the state, regardless of size. So that has expired as of December 31st, which brings us to the uh, HFWA public health emergency leave, which is 
uh, became effective on January 1st and effectively replaced the COVID-19 specific leave that was in place from July through December. Um, we'll get into this law in more detail later in the presentation, but um, I just want to emphasize the fact that PHEL uh, is not specific to COVID-19, and it will be in existence beyond uh, this public, the current public health emergency, um, but it does provide leave for the current COVID-19 public health emergency. And also, um, just to sort of emphasize, there is no credit or offset for the time provided in 2020 under the different uh, COVID-19 specific mandates. Uh, and the PHEL aspect of this law requires a completely new entitlement uh, for employees in Colorado as of January 1st, 2021. Okay, so on to the next slide. Um, we're going to take a closer look here at the general paid sick leave aspect of the law. As I mentioned before, this is very similar to some of the other laws unrelated to COVID uh, around the country. And um, even though it isn't necessarily specific to COVID, it is worth flagging that this aspect of the law does provide uh, leave related to public health emergencies. It applies to all Colorado employers um, with a caveat that if you have 16 or less employees, it does not apply until January 1st of 2022. Um, and this includes 16 employees uh, anywhere, not just limited to the state of Colorado. So it is a, a fairly broad mandate um, and a lot of employers will be covered. Um, and then in terms of the employees that it covers, it covers all Colorado employees. There's no hours worked eligibility requirements. It applies to part-time, full-time, temporary. Uh, the only exception would be independent contractors. This law does not apply to independent contractors. So on the next few slides, we'll take a look at some of the uh, important requirements for general paid sick leave. Uh, you'll see on the slide here the chart. It, the accrual aspect of the law is fairly typical um, in comparison to other laws around the country. Employees are allowed to accrue one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours worked. Um, employees must start accruing at the beginning of their employment. They are allowed to accrue up to 48 hours a year, and they are allowed to use up to 48 hours a year. Um, the usage and waiting period under the Colorado law is somewhat unique. There is none. Um, you are not allowed to impose any waiting period for employees. The general paid sick leave must be immediately available for use upon accrual. Um, as for year-end carryover, employees must be allowed to carry over any earned unused paid sick leave up to 48 hours at the end of the year. Um, there, the law does address front-loading, which, as many of you know, this means if you would like to provide all 48 hours, you know, all of the required entitlement up front at the beginning of the year, you are allowed to do that under the Colorado law. However, you know, as many of you may know, if you're familiar with other paid sick leave, sometimes the benefit of doing this is that you don't have to carry over at the end of the year. However, the law is unclear if front loading gets rid of the employer's obligation to carry over. And so at this point in time, if you, even if you are front loading the time, you are still likely required to allow employees to carry it over. Uh, this brings us to the next slide. Um, where we will cover the various reasons for use. Again, this is fairly typical, um, you know, compared to other laws around the country. It covers employees and family members who are sick or ill or seeking medical treatment, uh, it, 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 which also includes diagnosis and preventative care. Uh, there is a safe time aspect of this law, similar to the other laws that provides for time off for employees who are themselves victims or they have family members that are victims of domestic abuse, sexual assault, or harassment, and have uh, a need to be away from work for reasons related to that. Um, and as I mentioned before, there is, even within the general paid sick leave aspect of this law, there is uh, one of the reasons covered is uh, public health, is related to public health emergencies uh, where the business is closed or there are school or child care closures and the employee needs to be absent from work. Um, moving on here to, um, again, very similar to other leave laws, the law defines covered family member. 
uh, which includes, which is a fairly normal uh, definition, an employee's immediate family member um, and children, uh, both by blood and, of course, uh, you know, where there is other types of uh, relationships with children. And then the one aspect that's a little bit different that makes this uh, definition a little bit more broad than others you may have seen is it also covers uh, a person for whom the employee is responsible for providing and arranging health or safety related care. And this could be not necessarily somebody who's actually, they're actually related to. So that one is a, a little more broad than you may have seen in other laws. Um, and then the law also provides a very specific definition of public health emergency, which applies both for purposes of the general paid sick leave entitlement and for the public health emergency leave, which we're going to talk about in a minute here. Um, and, you know, I, this, you, you can see the definition here. Clearly, it, it uh, covers, you know, the COVID-19 public health emergency that we're, we're going through right now. Um, which, yeah, which should be pretty straightforward there. Okay, so on to the next slide. The last few important requirements under the general paid sick leave law, um, the increments of use, and I think I actually saw a question related to this. Um, the Colorado law does allow um, you employers to impose a one hour minimum increment of use. Uh, however, I do wanna flag here too, which I think is later on in the, um, the chart, if you do not have this in a written policy, then you will, you're possibly going to be required to allow employees to use time in six hour increments or six times, sorry, six minute increments. Um, so it's very important if you are wanting to impose a higher than six minute increment of use requirement that you have that in a written policy. Um, in terms of providing an employee, providing notice to the employer, uh, when the use of paid sick leave is foreseeable, the law requires that the employee make a good faith effort to provide notice in advance, um, which is, you know, subject to interpretation and there isn't much guidance on this, but it does vary slightly from, you know, as soon as practicable, which you see in other um, laws or uh, where they provide a certain number of days that's considered reasonable. This law does not do that. Um, also, a unique aspect is when the absences are unforeseeable, the law is actually silent on what type of notice the employer can, uh, can require. So there is some risk in providing or requiring notice for unforeseeable absences. Uh, because the law does not specifically say what you can and cannot do in that regard. As for documentation for general paid sick leave of four or more consecutive days, an employer can require reasonable um, documentation and the law specifically sets forth what is reasonable documentation, um, which is very similar to other laws. So I won't sort of go into detail on that, but it is, it's just the fairly standard uh, reasonable documentation definition that you've probably seen in other laws. Um, and then as for, so using existing policies for compliance, employee, employers can do that, um, but under two conditions, you have to make available to your employees through whatever policy you're using, the same amount of paid leave that's required under the law, and that also meets its accrual requirements. Um, and you have to obviously allow employees to use that time for the same purposes and under the same conditions required by the uh, HFWA. So moving on to the next slide, um, there are specific aspects of the law which define how you are supposed to pay uh, general paid sick leave, uh, which is at the same hourly rate or salary with the same benefits the employee normally earns during um, their hours worked. This must be at least minimum wage, um, but it does not need to include overtime bonuses or holiday pay. And if you have um, employees that are paid on commission or non-hourly employees, the law also sets forth how those types of employees are um, need to be paid. So that aspect of the law is worth paying attention to if you have those types of employees. Um, the law, this law does have uh, an available balance notice requirement. Um, 
but unlike other laws, it is upon an employee's request that the employer must provide the amount of paid leave the employee has. Um, and this includes both the time that they have available for use, including the, including the time they have accrued, and the time that they've already used during the current benefit year. And this also includes um, how much public health emergency leave is available to the extent you're in the middle of a public health emergency. Um, but these requests don't need to be uh, uh, complied with more than once uh, once a month. So there is some limitation there. Um, in terms of notice and posting, there are notice and posting requirements uh, that em employers must uh, comply with for general paid sick leave. Um, in terms of record keeping, employers are required to keep uh, for a period of two years documentation showing the hours worked, paid sick leave accrued, and um, how much paid sick leave has been used. Um, and then I mentioned briefly before in terms of a written policy requirement, uh, it is definitely best, best practice to maintain a written policy covering every aspect of the law. Um, and, and your practice and policy related to how you're complying with the law. Um, but the HFWA and its guidance specifically dis discuss certain aspects that you have to um, contain in a written policy. Specifically, uh, if the benefit year is different than a calendar year, that has to be set forth in a written policy. If um, the increments of use, as I mentioned before, aren't mentioned in a written policy, then it's going to be assumed that you're allowing employees to use uh, paid sick leave in six minute increments, which is uh, very important to include if you want to avoid that. And then if you are using PTO to comply with this law, it must be set forth in a written policy. So that covers the general paid sick leave aspect of the law, which brings us to the public health emergency portion of the law, which we uh, are getting the most questions about from our clients, given that it is you know, currently uh, in effect and applies to the current COVID-19 uh, public health emergency. So as I mentioned earlier, this aspect of the law went into effect on January 1st, 2021 and effectively replaced both the HELP rules and the HFWA COVID-19 specific uh, rules, which looked similar to the FFCRA. Um, this law requires that upon the declaration of a public health emergency, which as you can see by the definition here, clearly covers COVID-19, um, that employers must make additional time available for uh, various public health emergency related reasons. Um, this similar to the general paid sick leave law covers all employees in Colorado, um, except it does not cover independent contractors. For purposes of the current COVID-19 public health emergency, which most uh, of our clients are, clients are currently concerned with, and we've been getting uh, a substantial amount of questions on, the date of declaration is actually January 1st, 2021, which I know may sound weird because we all know this public health emergency has been in place you know, starting in March of 2020 or before. However, because the law or this aspect of the law just came into effect on January 1st, 2021, that is uh, what the law and the guidance have stated is the uh, effective date for purposes of this, addition, this additional entitlement. Um, so all, um, employees effective, or sorry, all employers effective January 1st, 2021 are required to provide this additional entitlement. Um, for full-time employees, um, it, it is 80 hours. And for employees working less than 40 hours, it is a prorated amount. Um, once employers provide this additional amount of time effective January 1st, 2021, employees are entitled to this amount of time only once during the um, entire course of the public health emergency until four weeks after it is declared over. So if, for example, COVID-19 uh, extends beyond 2021, which let's hope it does not, um, employers aren't required to provide an additional 80 hours. It just is one 80 hours or a prorated amount for part-time employees during the course, course of the same public health emergency until four weeks after it is declared to be over. So then moving on to the next slide. Um, 
So we have here the reasons for use uh, for public health emergency leave. They're fairly uh, standard or unfortunately have become fairly standard uh, in terms of what we've seen for you know, for other types of COVID-19 uh, specific laws. So I won't read through all of them, um, but generally it would cover employees who are diagnosed or test positive for COVID-19, anybody who has COVID-19 symptoms, employees who were ordered to quarantine for whatever reason um, based on a local state or um, federal public official or health authority mandate, um, employees needing care for family members in any of these categories, and then also school closures or uh, remote, uh, remote school. So employees who are sort of unavailable for either of those reasons also are entitled to use uh, public health emergency leave. Um, okay, and then on to the next topic or next slide, um, everybody's favorite topic is the potential offset that is available for public health emergency leave. Well, public health emergency leave is generally in addition uh, to paid sick leave or other types of paid time off that the em employer is providing. There is the potential um, to offset um, time that is being provided. So employers can offset the amount of public health emergency leave that they're required to provide to an employee for each hour of paid sick or other paid time off available that is actually available on the date that the public health emergency is declared. So, um, and we'll provide some examples here. Um, but if you are going to offset um, the pu public health emergency leave time um, by time that's already available. That time that's already available must be uh, available for the employees to use uh, in accordance with the public health emergency uh, leave law. And it, it is treated as protected public health emergency leave for purposes of notice, documentation, reasons for use, um, and so on and so forth. So. Um, Moving on here, here are some examples that sort of illustrate how this offset can be used. So if you have a full-time employee um, in Colorado that has 48 hours of paid sick leave or paid time off available on June 1st, assuming that's the date we've chosen that the public health emergency is declared, um, the employee will receive then only an additional 32 hours of public health emergency leave. Um, so you have the 48 hours of paid sick leave plus the 32 hours of public health emergency brings you to that 80 hours. And then the employee can use 48 hours um, of the paid sick leave or paid time off for um, paid sick leave or other PTO reasons, or they can use it for public health emergency leave covered absences. And then the 32 hours that you've then made available on June 1st can only be used for public health emergency leave covered absences. Another example is if you have a full-time employee that um, has zero hours of paid sick leave or paid time off available on June 1st when a public health emergency is declared, that employee will, see, will receive a full 80 hours of public health emergency leave, which can be only used for public health emergency leave covered absences. One thing we want to flag here, um, given the effective date of the general paid sick leave law, and uh, which sort of corresponds with the public health health emergency leave mandate January 1st, we, um, if you are not front loading the paid sick leave time on, on January 1st of 48 hours, then you are required to provide that full 80 hours of public health emergency leave. Whereas you, if you are front loading 48 hours of paid sick leave, then you are required, you're only required pardon, to provide 32 hours of that public health emergency leave reasons. And why this is important is because if you are doing an accrual policy, and so you have zero hours accrued at a, as of January 1st, you have to provide the 80 hours and then you have to continue to allow employees to accrue up to 48 hours of paid sick leave time. So the total amount of time, you know, between paid sick leave and public health emergency is going to be up to 128 hours, whereas if you front load 48 hours and you're only providing an additional 32 hours to satisfy the public health emergency leave mandate, you know, there, that's the full amount of time that people are going to have available both for paid sick leave and for public health emergency leave, at least for that calendar year. 
Um, anyhow, I'll just go over one of these for purposes of time. Um, one of these examples related to somebody who's not uh, an employee who's not a full time employee. So if you have an employee scheduled to work 30 hours a week and they are given 48 hours of paid sick leave um, available on the date the public health emergency is declared, that employee only actually receives an additional 12 hours for a total of 60 hours of public health emergency leave, which is a prorated amount um, based on their 30 hours worked each week, um, proportional to that, uh, the total amount of time that they work each week. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide, um, you know, some of the other requirements um, of the public health emergency leave related to employee notice and documentation. Um, in terms of reporting absences, uh, this is the same as I discussed earlier on um, the general paid sick leave aspect of the law, uh, foreseeable absences, uh, it's, it's a good faith effort standard in terms of providing notice in advance, and the law is silent um, in regards to how uh, far in advance employees need to provide uh, notice for unforeseeable absences. Um, one big, one important aspect of this law is that you cannot actually deny paid sick leave for non-compliance with any notice policy. Um, so there is some gray area in with this aspect of the law. And then importantly, in terms of documentation, for public health emergency leave, you cannot require employees to provide documentation, which uh, diverges from what's required for the general paid sick leave uh, law, where you can ask for documentation after four or more consecutive uh, days of absence. Okay, then the last, uh, moving on here to the last uh, slide, uh, there is the same notice and poster requirement as I discussed for the general paid sick leave law. Um, and then similarly, as I mentioned earlier, um, the available balance notice requirement also provide or also applies to public health emergency leave time. Um, it must be provided upon request no more than one time per month. Um, and employers can comply, there is guidance on this um, by including this information on a pay stub or including it um, on the internet uh, or intranet where employees uh, have access. Uh, or you can just provide a, a separate type of notice upon the employee's request um, apart from pay stubs or the internet. So uh, that brings us to the end of the Colorado specific section. I know we covered a lot, so please feel free to reach out to me after the webinar if you have specific questions that we aren't able to answer through the chat function. Um, and now I will pass this over to Marlon to talk about Maine and New York. Thanks very much, Meg. Um, so I'll start out by talking about the Maine Earned Paid Leave Law. And one thing you'll notice here is that you don't see the word sick or save time on that slide. And the reason for that is because Maine is one of the three PTO laws um, that are uh, right now existing in the US. It was the first law to be enacted, but the last one to go into effect, it went into effect January 1st of this year. Just for reference, the other PTO laws out there are the Nevada law, which went into effect on January 1st of last year, and the Bernalillo County, New Mexico law, which went into effect a few months ago on October 1st. Here on this slide, we see some of the legal requirements of the main uh, PTO law. Um, in terms of coverage, um, although the definition of employer is generally broad, um, the law covers employers who employ more than 10 employees in the usual and regular course of business for more than 120 days in any calendar year. The term employee is very broad and covers anyone engaged in employment as defined by the state's unemployment compensation provision. Although the law is unique, as you'll see, the reason for use is that the employee can use the leave for any reason. There is not um, too much that's unique about this law in terms of all the other um, requirements that you see on the slide. So employees accrue leave at the rate of one hour for every 40 hours worked up to 40 hours per year with the usage cap and a carryover cap of 40 hours. Now the usage cap and carryover cap were not clear from the law, but the regulations were able to clarify that those are in fact 40. One um, 
thing to keep in mind here is that there is an FAQ that suggests that there might be a point in time accrual cap, uh, but that FAQ is not binding. So that's something to keep an eye out of um, uh, um, as you know, new guidance may come about. Um, and because this law uh, provides leave for any reason, there's no corresponding family uh, member definition like we see with most paid sick leave laws. Next slide, please. Um, here you'll see the increments of use, which is at least one hour, um, unless, of course, the employer chooses to have a smaller increment of use. You just cannot have an increment that is greater than that. In terms of notice, uh, you can require notice from employees. There are some um, laws, you know, with PTO laws, it's unclear if you could require notice, but in this case, you can. Um, and absent an emergency illness or other sudden necessity, an employer can have a written policy requiring up to four weeks notice. Uh, but if it is for a sudden illness or emergency, then we, the request for notice has to be reasonable and employees just have to make a good faith effort to provide as much notice as is feasible, which is pretty common um, in sick leave laws um, in regards to unforeseeable absences. But if it is foreseeable, something like, you know, a vacation or something that is not relating to an illness, you can require the greater notice of four weeks as long as that is in a written policy. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, the good thing about the main uh, law is that an employer can put certain reasonable limits on employees scheduling of leave for reasons other than emergency illness or sudden necessity. So if an employee is to use the time for vacation, you do have some control regarding to scheduling if it would cause undue hardship. Um, and the regulations explain a little bit of how you determine um, what is undue hardship. In terms of documentation, there's no provision in the law and unfortunately, neither the regulations or guidance address this requirement. So it's unclear if you can require documentation. Next slide, please. And now finally, for me, looking at the non-policy requirements. Um, so these are things that don't typically, um, that are not typically included in the written policy. Um, the good news is that there is no available balance notice requirement, and this is a great thing because as we'll see with New York State and New York City in just a few seconds, um, this is a burdensome requirement. There is a requirement um, to place a poster and although the law does not have a specific written policy mandate, if you want to take advantage of um, the notice requirement we discussed before, so if you want to require notice when employees use time for things like vacation and other non-emergency needs, um, then that has to be in a written policy. So uh, make sure you include that. Um, and that wraps up Maine, and now we'll be moving on to New York. So with New York, we're not going to go into a ton of detail about all the requirements of the state or the local paid sick and safe leave laws, because we went through those in detail during part one of this webinar series. Uh, but we will um, give a quick refresher on the law, um, as well as highlight some of the differences between the New York State and New York City law. And then at the very end, we're going to talk briefly about Westchester and where that stands. But just by um, way of background, the New York State law went into effect on September 30th of 2020. Um, the New York City law, although that's been around for a while, it was amended late last year in an attempt to align with the New York State law, although we will see that there are some major differences between the two, well, some significant differences. Um, and the amendments to the New York City law went into effect on uh, September 30th, 2020, just like the state law. So on this slide, you'll see a brief refresher of everything that we discussed during part one, the accrual rate, accrual cap, usage cap. Now, one thing I did want to point out here is that there were some open questions with, um, you know, the accrual cap and usage cap, because as you, as you see, those are dependent on the employer size. Now, when we presented part one, we were still waiting for regulations. Um, right now, the state released um, 
proposed regulations in December, um, and those are now subject to a comment period until February 7th. So hopefully we'll be getting final regulations soon. Uh, but based on the proposed regulations, unfortunately, this gray area of um, whether we count employees only in New York State or employees nationwide to determine how much leave an employer must provide employees with, uh, we are still left with that open question. Um, you know, it is possible that that might be something that's addressed in the final regulations on it or in a different set of proposed regulations. But as of right now, unfortunately, we do not have uh, much guidance on that. Another place where we did not get additional guidance is in regards to year end carryover. The law does not provide for a year end carryover cap and neither does any of the guidance or the proposed regulations. So as it stands, there is no year carryover cap in New York and employers must permit employees to carry over any accrued unused leave to the following year. Um, I did wanna point out the usage waiting period. There is no usage waiting period. Employees were able to begin using New York State paid sick leave starting this January 1st and they are able to use it as that time becomes available, whether that's through accrual or through front loading. Um, as Meg mentioned with Colorado, this is a unique provision. And as of right now, only New York State, New York City, and Colorado have no waiting period. Front loading, again, this is the same thing as we saw with Colorado. It is permitted, but it's unclear front loading gets rid of an employer's carryover obligations. And the uh, proposed regulations did not do anything to address that. Um, and with that, we'll be moving on to the next slide. As you'll see, this slide discusses the same requirements we just discussed for New York State, but for New York City. One important thing to keep in mind, you'll see on all the New York City slides on the left-hand side, it says to follow the New York State law if it is more generous. And if you look at the slide, a lot of the things like the accrual rate cap, um, accrual rate, accrual cap, usage cap, uh, year, and you know, front loading and usage waiting period look the same. However, with year and carryover, you'll, you see that that looks different for New York City than New York State, because the New York City law um, limited carryover to either 40 or 56 hours, depending on the employer size. But because New York State is more generous by not having a cap, we follow the New York State law in that regard. Um, we are still waiting for amended regulations for New York City, so um, we have to keep an eye out on that to make sure that um, um, that there is, uh, you know, to see if there are any updates when the um, amended regulations are released. Um, and as we'll see on the next slide, um, we are jumping back to New York State to look at some more of the important legal requirements. Um, increments of use, you'll see that you could set an increment uh, not to exceed four hours. This is different than New York City because New York City has an initial increment of four hours, but thereafter employers have to permit employees to use leave in increments of 30 minutes. New York State does not have um, that um, post initial increment um, requirement like New York City does. So if you are in New York City, it's important to keep an eye out for that difference and to follow the standard of New York City since that's more generous in this case. In terms of notice to the employer, you will see that it's very vague uh, and just says that the employer has to permit employees to use leave um, upon oral or written request. This lacks detail. Uh, especially compared to New York City, which permits um, employees to, um, well, permits employers to require notice of up to seven days for foreseeable absences. So this is one of those areas that if you're operating in New York City, it's difficult to know if you can apply the seven day standard still given the lack of specificity in New York. We work with employers all the time to try to mitigate risks regarding this. In terms of documentation, again, New York State did not have um, any standard in the law whatsoever other than to restrict employers from disclosing confidential information. Um, 
However, the proposed regulations do have uh, do suggest that there is a standard coming. Based on the proposed regulations, employers would be able to require employees to use uh, to um, require documentation for absences of three or more consecutive and previously scheduled work days or shifts. Um, they can only require it for uh, sick leave, not safe leave, which is a difference from New York, because New York, there is a list of documents you could require in connection with safe leave. Uh, the other difference with New York City is that um, while New York State uh, will permit them, if this standard goes through, uh, for will permit documentation for absences of three or more consecutive um, days, New York City requires it for, uh, in New York City, you can only require documentation if the absence is for more than three consecutive days. So employers have to be careful in uh, making those work together. Um, and, you know, if you're in New York City, you have to keep an eye out for both standards and apply the most generous one. There are a number of risks if you are going to require documentation for um, safe time absences, but that's something that we work with employers all the time to try to mitigate the risks. Um, where New York State and New York City agree are that their um, employee cannot be required to pay for any of the costs or fees associated with obtaining medical or other verification of eligibility of use of sick leave. So that's another thing to consider when deciding uh, what kind of absences you want to require documentation for. Next slide, please. So, um, so then uh, for New York State, we're just going to go over some of the available balance, um, some of the non-written policy requirements, including the available balance notice, uh, which must be provided to employees within three business days of the employees requesting it. There is no notice and posting requirement, but there is a written policy mandate, so that's important to keep in mind uh, and have a written policy. Next slide, please. So here you'll see the available balance notice requirement for New York City, which is a lot more strict than New York State, requiring that it be provided with a pay stub. Uh, so each pay period, either with a pay stub or in a separate writing requirement. This um, is already in effect and it's been in effect since late last year. So employers who have not implemented this should be sure to do so. Um, notice and posting requirements. There were some questions there regarding whether this went into effect at the end of September or in January 1st. But what we know is that now both of these are definitely in effect um, and employers should be complying with that, as well as the written policy mandate, which New York City has a very stringent one. Um, next slide, please. And then very briefly on Westchester, when we last presented, it was unclear if the Westchester County paid sick leave law was still in effect. Um, we now know that Westchester County repealed its sick leave law and employers in Westchester County need only follow the New York State paid sick leave law uh, for the state. But to keep in mind, um, what's very important is that Westchester County paid safe time law is still in effect, so employers should have a separate policy to comply with that. And with that, I will uh, pass it on to Josh. Great, next slide, please. So just before we jump into the last couple of minutes here, the CLE code for today is SS0113. Again, that is SS as in Sidefar Shaw, 0113. So turning to the last few slides, status of federal paid sick leave. There is a federal contractor paid sick leave executive order number 13706 from the Obama administration that went into effect back in 2017. It's still around. It applies to federal contractors and subcontractors with certain types of contracts. Um, it is the only law that's out there today in the sick leave space that crosses state borders. So it's important to keep that one in mind if you do have federal contracts or subcontracts. The federal FFCRA, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, sunset at the end of last year. Um, that said, for employers that are still offering uh, those benefits to employees voluntarily, they can still receive the tax credits um, from the federal government through at least the end of 2021 Q1, so the end of March of this year. 
Uh, the bottom topic there, the Healthy Families Act, that one is really worth keeping an eye on as we head into the Biden administration, um, given the setup of Congress as it stands today. Paid sick leave is one of those bipartisan topics, and this Healthy, Healthy Families Act um, is something that has already been introduced and is hovering out there and could come under increased focus in the next six to 12 months. It would not preempt state or local laws as it currently stands. That's one of the big pieces would be one hour for every 30 hours worked, up to 56 hours per year of accrual, with importantly, no cap on annual usage. So that's an important current gap in this law or silence uh, area of this, of this uh, not law, but this bill that is hovering out there right now. So keep an eye on the Healthy Families Act as we head into the new year. Next slide, please. So a recap for you here, laws that have gone into effect recently. We've covered New York State and New York City with their increased usage caps and usage beginning. Maine and Colorado both having their mandates starting up on 1-1-2021. And the COVID supplemental sick leave mandates with a number of them getting extended and still other localities and states that could join that bandwagon in the coming months as the pandemic continues on. Next location is likely to adopt at the state level, keep an eye on Illinois, Hawaii, Virginia, and New Mexico, with Virginia and New Mexico being the two that seem most likely and most poised to pass a statewide sick leave law um, in the coming months. Really keep an eye on those two. There's been a lot of chatter about them um, in the last few weeks. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, uh, in terms of sick leave resources, we have a great mailing list um, that you can sign up for. It will take about a minute. You'll get all of our client alerts and blog posts on sick leave in real time. We also have a comprehensive paid sick leave survey that we offer to clients that covers all federal, state, local paid sick leave laws in existence, COVID, non-COVID, PTO, sick leave, you name it. it. covers about 50 different substantive topics. So that resource is there for subscribing clients. If you want more information, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters or the paid leave at SciParts.com email provided there for you. Uh, and on the final slide, we just want to say thank you so much to everyone for attending. Um, our contact information is here for your reference. We really appreciate your time and look forward to, to you attending our next segment of our paid sick leave webinar series, which again, we'll be talking about uh, the COVID-19 sick leave landscape in the next month or so. Thanks again. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. As a reminder, you will receive a copy of the materials, recording, and CLE attendance verification form in the days following the program. Thank you for attending.